Think Forward. Think Research Channel. There's a structural problem with genocide, which is that it tends to happen in places that are off the beaten path. So now, in order to promote nonviolence and reduce violence, ultimately we have to address the motivation. Society needs to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong challenge. The sit-ins challenge cherished beliefs, most whites held dearly. At the DNA level, we're all 99.9% .9 the same, all of us. So individuals do matter. And I think the quality of our individual leadership matters. Who is speaking for poor people? 40 million Americans make $6 an hour. Who is speaking for them? The only thing that one has after throwing everything overboard is the love that one can give. The argument of my book, you know, there's two parts. I talk about why there are sex differences and why we have good evidence of that, about aggression, nurturing, and um, sex. And I also talk about uh, what I think we should do, given the fact that these differences exist, how we should think about our culture differently and change our policies. And I don't think that the first part of that is all that controversial among people who do research in this area. I know it is in many circles and universities, one reason I say that is someone called Janet Hyde, who's a, who's a strong feminist, whose work is used in most women's studies departments. She wrote a big review essay of all the evidence we had called the similarities hypothesis and argued that men and women are, are pretty much alike. But on the, what I talk about, and what I'm going to talk about today, for example, sex and nurturing, she didn't disagree at all. She said the differences about casual, interest in casual sex are large, and they were close to very large in her categories. And the interest, uh, differences in, she called it tender-mindedness rather than nurturing, are also large, close to very large. So the differences come, I think, with what we make of these differences. And I think we'd make great progress if we could just agree there really are fundamental differences and then figure out what we should do about that. I begin my book with a horrifying story, which by itself, I think, suggests there have got to be fundamental differences which are not controlled by nurture. It's, it's a, a case of identical twins go in for a circumcision back in the mid-60s. One of them comes out without his penis, and the question is, what do we do with that guy? There's some expert at Johns Hopkins, supposed expert, who says, well, he hasn't formed his gender identity yet. Let's chop off his testicles and put a little slit there and shooting full of estrogen and testosterone-blocking drugs, and he won't know the difference while raising him as a little girl. And for over a decade, this doctor misreported what was happening, said it was going well, and the article said little Brenda was remarkably neat and dainty. Well, it turned out to all be a lie. Um, some a journalist and another skeptical researcher found him, and Brenda was now called David, living in Canada, living as a male, the adopted father of uh, three kids. And it turned out that all along, he'd always felt he was a male. At, at 14 years of age, he told his parents, I'm a boy. And at 15, they told him the truth, and then they tried to give him mastectomies and turn him back into a boy as best they could. Anyway, if you look at the story of his life, when he, when he was first given a jump rope, he whipped people with it. He, 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 wanted to he wanted to shave like his dad. He wanted to urinate standing up. The first time he was put in a dress, he ripped it off. The teachers in his elementary school said that he was the most, had the most pressing, aggressive need to dominate that they'd ever seen in a little girl. Now, Johns Hopkins, after this story came out, went back and looked at other of this Dr. Money's patients. These had been kids who had been born without penises, and he'd recommended the same thing, and they'd, they tried to turn them into girls, and, and they found that every one of these 25 liked rough-and-tumble play when they were little boys, like boys tend to do and girls don't. 
14, these were ages 5 to 14 when they now went back and saw how they were doing. And 14 of the 25 had already declared to their parents that they were boys. Being raised as girls, having pumps full of all this estrogen and so on, that doesn't happen very often. I mean, occasionally someone says, I want to become a boy. But, to, but for people to be absolutely convinced they're boys when they've been raised from infancy as a girl is pretty unusual and suggests that there's something happening before pe people are even born that gives them a sense of uh, who they are, what their sex is. And, and most scholars think it's testosterone in the womb that does this. A sad story, the guy ended up, after I published the book, committing suicide. It just suggests, well, you get these things wrong and you can really do a lot of harm. Now, there's other evidence we have uh, that sex differences run deep. One is other hormonal studies suggesting that the more testosterone you're exposed to in utero, the more likely you are to be aggressive and competitive and assertive. And testosterone also dampens nurturing behavior. Aside from these hormonal studies, all around the world, societies think, if you ask them, you know, who's more aggressive in your society, men or women, they always say men, and they, who's more nurturing, they always say women. Not the majority, the vast majorities. Uh, also, these differences appear very early in life, uh, before boys and girls really understand the gender stereotypes. Boys are doing rough and tumble play, and girls are more interested in dolls. It's not until about the age of three that people realize what most boys do and what most girls do. They have a sense, but, but before that age, they know what they like to do. And they are what the gender stereotypes suggest. Boys like to play with balls more before two. Girls like to dance more before two. And uh, another important difference is at 12 months of age, girls respond more empathetically to the distress of others through more sad looks, sympathetic vocalizations, and comforting behavior. But today, I don't want to just focus on the argument of my book. I want to engage the people who are most unhappy with my book. And, and they're usually women. And they're usually educated women. And not all of them, by any means. Most women I hear from love the book. And, but the ones who don't like the book, who hate the book, are usually educated women who are convinced that this book and any serious attention to sex differences will be, have disastrous implications for women's well-being. So I want to address that, because I think just the opposite. I think that um, taking more, giving more attention to sex differences would uh, improve the lives of men, but it would improve the lives of women more. Now, I call my opposites, the women who are opposed to focusing on sex differences, androgynous feminists. There's an equity kind of feminist who's, who's, who believes in equal rights before the law, as I do, and equal pay for equal work, and so on. But the androgynous feminists, uh, I think they dominate the National Organization for Women and the Women's Studies Departments and most of the humanities and large parts of the social sciences. I think they, they think that, uh, aside from the obvious anatomical differences, that there are no fundamental differences between men and women. Uh, and those that ex seem to exist are, are the result of society, of how we, edu how we bring up boys and girls rather than the result of nature. I want to focus today on sex and nurturing of children. And I think the feminist position on this, androgynous feminist position, goes something like this. The double standard of sluts and studs has for too long restricted women's exploration of their sexuality. Women's sexual liberation is an important part of women's liberation more generally. And young women should condition their consent to sex on pleasure and desire, as one of influential books puts it, have sex for the sheer pleasure of it. On children, androgynous feminists say that women have to bear them, but men are just as good at bringing them up. And in a just world, men and women should be equally responsible for child care and for work outside the home. Androgynous feminists are adamant about this because they think that only an equal division of all labor will enable women to have equal power and money uh, with their husbands or with men. Now, my critique of this uh, outlook begins with the assumption about what most women care most deeply about. So I'm going to focus on most women. As I mentioned, there are different kinds of women. I, I explore this at, at length in my book. Uh, ones who are more career-oriented, who are more assertive and aggressive, who are less interested in babies and dolls when they're young. On average, they've been exposed to more testosterone. They're different from most women. I want to focus on most women and what I think they care most about. And I think it's emotionally close relationships. In his book, The Essential Difference, 
uh, Simon Baron Cohen notes that one day old baby girls look at a picture of a human face longer than one day old baby boys do. And similarly, one day old, if, the, if you play a recording of another baby crying, both baby boys and baby girls will cry, but baby girls cry longer. Now, Cohen uses this and a lot of other evidence to, to, to argue that women have a, have a more empathizing brain than men do, and that females of all ages seem to care more about others' well-being than males do. Now, boys have a passion for things, and they tend to be very tunnel-directed. You know, you probably, if you raise boys, you probably know they change these things. It could be dinosaurs, and then it's baseball statistics, and soccer, or computers. It doesn't have much to do with their parents. They don't know where they get it from. They just, all they want to think about for a year or two is those things. And boys tend to get together with other boys who share their interest in those activities that they're interested in. Girls get together not so much for the activities as for sharing confidences in long, self-revealing conversations, putting arms around each other. Girls and women, most of all, want connection. And when they go through puberty, estrogen makes women more social. They spend more time with other people. Testosterone makes men less social. They spend more time alone. If you look at male prisons and female prisons, it's quite dramatic. Male prisons are all about domination and aggression. Female prisons, in large proportions of them, set up artificial families. These women miss connections so much that they say, you be the uncle, you be the aunt, you be the kid, I'm the father, you're the mother. And they have pseudo families in the prisons. Another sign, I think, of women's deep need for connection is if you look at unmarried childless women, this group, you might think, these are the ones who are the careers, they, and, and they're really different. And one of the reasons maybe they didn't get married is they didn't want to interfering, a family interfere with their careers. But if you ask them, what's the most important thing for your happiness of unmarried childless women? Uh, five times more say something to do with connection. 31% 30, say my relationship with my mother, most important to my happiness. 22% say relationship with my friends, 11% say my careers, most important to my happiness. Okay, with this background then, let's turn to sex. When, when girls go through puberty, the combination of hormones and their long-standing desire for strong, intimate relationships often leads them to be boy crazy. As young teenagers, they often spend hours reading romantic fiction or playing board games about dating and boys. But girls are more interested in relationships that may lead to sex, whereas boys are more interested in the sex. And in and out of marriage, women usually say they engage in sex to share emotions and love. Men give reasons that are much more narrowly physical. Need, sexual gratification, sexual release, these are the reasons they say they engage in sex. And men are much more interested in sex with a variety of partners. Now, what happens? The sociologist Elijah Anderson describes an inner city culture where the young girls have a dream, a dream of loving, providing mates, while their often older partners are playing a game in which sexual conquests are the prize. Female researchers have describe in the most unlikely places, in British street gangs or in African tribes, the same kind of phenomena of young teen girls looking for a providing, protecting older guy. And one of the authors, uh, these female authors, says it, it appears that there's a period of mating optimism among young adult women, which may be a regular feature of female psychology. Now, it seems to me that women's studies programs and women's centers should alert young women to the fact that young men are frequently more interested in sex than in the relationships. Now, I don't think they do, because they want to say everybody's the same. And women should be the same in their sexuality as men are. But they're not the same. The surveys report that 71% of teenage girls report being in love with their last sexual partner, and 45% of boys do. And teen girls are much more likely to regret their previous sexual experiences than boys are, and much more likely to say they wish they waited longer to have sex. Several studies have also noted the precipitous rise in depression rates among young teenage females. And the depression is often preceded by the breakup of a sexual relationship that the girl at least saw as romantic. Now, the real world of middle school girls can be a nightmare. Most of you know Montgomery County. It's in Maryland, a suburb of Washington, a high-income county. This is from a school there. 
And at, the, at this middle school, and I'm, I'm told this is not unique by any means these days, at this school, 13-year-old girls get casual, routine invitations to have sex all day long. Most of the boys ask. The typical query is, when are you going to give me head? The Washington Post article reports that some of the requests go beyond words. The reporter asked one girl to keep a little diary, and, she, and the worst of what she entered was she was kneeling to get books from her uh, locker, and a boy comes up and sticks his crotch in her face and says, oh yeah, you're the best. Now, what do you say to a boy who does this? Uh, I don't think you can say much if you assume boys and girls are the same about sex. If you have an androgynous understanding of sex, if you say to this boy, well, how would you feel if she did that to you? What's he going to say? Great, do you think you could get her to? You know? It's not the same at all. He doesn't find, I mean, girls find it degrading and, and threatening in some way. Boys don't. They just think it's good fun. It's just another kind of horseplay. Why make a big deal about it? We're not going to get anywhere in changing it unless we say boys and girls are different about this sort of thing. Girls are more vulnerable in sexual matters. Okay, now let's go to college. John Townsend's an anthropologist who, who surveyed several hundred students about sexual relationships, romantic relationships, then picked out the 50 most active, 25 girls, 25 boys, who had the most sexual partners, and focused in on them. And he asked the following question, whether they agreed with this or disagreed. Even if I think I don't want to be emotionally involved with a person, if I have sex with him or her a few times, I begin to feel vulnerable and would at least like to know that he or she cares for me. 50% of the males disagreed with this statement. 4% of the females did. So 50% of the men don't care if their sexual partners care about them. Now, he then gives a full description of the five most sexually active females. Every one of them is kind of is competitive, is aggressive, wants careers, you know, has always loved to play boys' sports and so on, has absolutely no principled or religious objection to casual sex. Every one of the five has found, though, despite their liberated attitudes, that their emotions get in the way of casual sex. And after a couple of years of it, they decided it just doesn't work for me. They think it's just an individual thing. They're not interested in sleeping with men who are uninterested in relationships. Next, I want to talk about cohabitation, which is the, what women have to look forward to after college these days. And just one of many studies reveals that women tend to see living together as a step toward marriage, while men regard it as a sexual opportunity without the ties of long-term commitment. Surveys indicate that since the sexual revolution, women have begun to think worse of men. I'll just give you one example. This is pretty dramatic because it's a guy who wrote a book after interviewing 2,000 women and 2,000 men about romantic and sexual relationships. A reporter asks him, what's the big difference you found? One word, rage. Lots of women feel rage toward men. Men don't feel any rage toward women. If you look at any big bookstore, you'll find rows of books aimed at women with titles like How to Heal the Heart by Hating and The Woman's Book of Revenge, which, which among other things says, destroy his stuff. <laughs> All right. Now, it seems to me if we stop telling women that men and, uh, and women have no significant differences between li in libido and taste for sexual variety, women will be better able to protect themselves will get less female depression and less rage toward men. Now, marriage has a special appeal to women because women get both men are willing to commit and a greater opportunity for strong relationships with babies as well as husbands. And women want babies, and many who want them aren't getting them. About 18% of 40-year-old women have no children. This is about doubled from the 1960s. A recent Gallup poll found that 70% of them wish they had had children. Of those undergoing infertility treatments, 50% of women, but only 15% of men, say it's the most upsetting experience of their lives. A Harvard Medical School study found that women undergoing infertility treatment had levels of depression comparable to patients with AIDS and cancer. Now, it seems to me androgynous feminists are unconcerned. Many highly educated women overestimate their chances of getting pregnant after age 40. They see examples of it and don't realize how unlikely it is. As a result, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine wanted to place public service ads in shopping malls that could have helped correct this misinformation. 
The ads were designed to enable women to make reproductive choices based on the facts. In particular, they wanted to tell people how to avoid infertility. The opposition of the National Organization for Women aborted the whole program. The ad that particularly angered Nal contained the following message. Advancing age decreases your ability to have children. Nal said that ad and the other ads were scare tactics. They further argued that the ad sent a negative message to women who might want to delay or skip childbearing in favor of their career pursuits. Androgynous feminism is no more help to women who get the children they want. Women have lots of the nurturing hormone oxytocin and little of the nurturing suppressing hormone testosterone. They truly like to spend lots of time with their children. If you look in families where mothers and fathers, as a matter of principle, try to take equal care of the kids and interview the fathers and the mothers, they both say there are emotional differences. The mothers are emotionally more connected to the kids. They feel separation from the kids to be more disagreeable, anxiety provoking. Despite the emphasis on androgynous roles in Sweden, if you look at fathers going back to work after taking leave and mothers going back to work after taking leave, the mothers feel much worse about it than the fathers do. Another sign of differences in this nurturing instinct for small children. Men usually do the fun stuff with kids, and this is a great complaint of wives, right? That, you know, they want to play with them and they want to read them a book sometime, but what about all the other stuff that you've got to do when you have a kid? They don't like to do that much. So you might think, therefore, that if you asked mothers and fathers how much they like parenting, the fathers would say they liked it more because they're doing only the fun stuff and the women are doing the fun and the not so fun. That's not what we get. Mothers say they like parenting more than fathers say they like parenting. After they have kids, most women would prefer not to work or to work only part time. They're typically less willing than men to spend their whole days away from their children. They want to see the first steps, hear the first words, they feel guilty and anxious if they spend 10 hour days away from their children. And this is true even if the kids are older, middle school and high school. Uh, I'll just summarize quickly several studies on this. One study of sex differences in psychological stress among married couples notes that for wives but not husbands, it is especially stressful to be married and employed with minor children. A second study of mothers finds that those who work have more stress than those who don't. A third study also of mothers finds that those who work are far more conflicted about working than homemakers are about staying at home. And working moms, and this is the, these are the author's words, pervasive internal struggle was as common with uh, those with teenagers as those with preschoolers. Even those with fully supportive husbands who completely supported their wives' careers often were highly conflicted. A fourth study shows that working moms with minors at home have levels of cortisol indicating high stress, more of that than do other women without kids who are doing the same jobs. This result again is obtained independent of how much support they get from their husband or other social support. Now I have lots of moving stories, anecdotes in, in the book and cartoons, I try not to make it too dry. But the anecdotes I pick are examples where you might not expect these phenomena to appear in these kinds of women. I'll give you just one of them here. Madeleine Coonan was a, a two-term governor of Vermont while she had young children. And she writes an autobiography after re uh, finishing her last term in which she says the following. At least once a day, I would feel a stab in my chest thinking I should be at one place when I was at another. There was no cure for the anxiety. All I could do was not to let it overwhelm me, not to let it pull me down, but to carry it as gracefully as I could. Now, one answer to the torment that so many mothers feel would be high-quality, part-time jobs. Women these days often complain about why aren't there better part-time jobs. Career paths are too rigid. But we shouldn't forget that in 1989, almost a whole generation ago, a major figure, Felice Schwartz, proposed an answer to this problem. She wrote in the Harvard Business Review and she said we should have two different tracks in business. She was the head of Catalyst, an organization whose only purpose is to advance the interests of women in business. She said we should have two tracks, a career track and a career and family track. Pe uh, women on the career and family track wouldn't have to pin put in as long hours, but they could stay connected to their company, connected to their work, and they'd settle in the medium term for middle management, but they'd be happier with this mix than they are now. There was outrage in the letters to the editor, one of the most greatest flurries ever. 
from women who said this would be a disaster for women. The National Organization for Women and the National Women's Political Caucus and several other groups had a jointly authored letter where they said uh, this would be a disaster. It'll be a disaster even if you make it gender neutral, even if you say men can go on the career and family track too if they want. But the, still they said women will be the ones who take it. Everybody knows that and therefore it'll come to be a, a mommy track and will cut off women's employment opportunities. They went on to say if any business sets up a career and family track, we will sue you. And they also said, why didn't Felice Schwartz talk about why men don't do half the child care instead of coming up with this ridiculous proposal? Now, androgynous feminists want women to be as likely to rise above the glass ceiling as men are. That's the reason they get their umbrage at these things, whether it's how do you make people pregnant or how to have a career and family track. And they realize that if you, if you go in these directions, women are not going to be as likely, proportionally, to rise above the glass ceiling get the real powerful jobs in society. But my own research, even in a very androgynous group, here, uh, at the national survey of women assistant professors with kids under two who are trying to get tenure, and their opinions about androgyny and who should do everything are very liberated, very men and women should do everything equally and so on. But when we ask who does each of these 25 tasks more often in your family, the female professors, I, on average, say they do every one of them more, and the male professors say they do every one of them less. Even buying the groceries for the kid, you know, anything you can think of, the women are doing more. But also interesting, we also ask, how much do you like doing each of these 25 tasks? The women like doing 24 of the 25 more than the men. A pretty liberated group, androgynous feminists with, PA, I mean, most of them, with PhDs who want to get tenure, uh, and it would press to get tenure, and if you ask them if you, do you like doing these tasks, even, even uh, changing diapers, more of them said they liked it than disliked it, not the men. Now, so uh, it seems to me that if we ever came up with a world in which men and women did everything equally, at home and at work, neither one would be as happy as they otherwise could be. Women who work uh, 37 hours a week full-time on average, full-time worker, you know, it's anything over 35. Women work 37 hours a week, men work 43 on average. But if you ask who's more unhappy about the long hours, it's women. That's because they want, they would prefer part-time work. And largely because they want to spend more time with their families. And it seems to me our culture and our policy will become more female-friendly if we realize these are deep-seated sex differences. And not only that, but there's different ways to think about power. Power is throwing your weight around and being the best at writing wills and therefore making a whole lot of money or whatever. But uh, it's also, uh, this was the words of another author that I really think are great. She said, a lot of women think of power in a different way. They think of power as creating relationships, binding families, and building societies. Now, if one of the sexes, sexes is better at that, Think about it, creating relationships, binding families, and building societies. That's a kind of power. It's a kind of power that seems to be quite admirable, and we should give it more respect. Thank you. Thank you.